Um, today we're going to talk about the first five years of bicycling in America, 1865 to 1870, uh, basically the introduction of velocity. So we'll start with a little bit of prehistory before America. Uh, we'll go over the players. You have um, Pierre Michaud, which is the most famous name linked with the velocity. Um, he was a mechanic, he was a locksmith, he made a dandy pair of shrubbery shears back in 1855. Um, he had a, a workshop in downtown uh, Paris, and he was basically a contract worker. The Michaud name was linked to many velocities, so it was kind of like Kleenex, so it became a generic name for Michaud or Michaud type. Um, in 1865, his son, Ernest, took out a patent for a train, not a velocity. And you can look at his age here, 23. The, the people that were involved here were very young. But Ernest was uh, interested in steam. He made an amusement park train. Um, it went in circles. And the, the, the attraction to it, in fact, was the, the axles were punched off center to the operator. The riders who got to pan it got to go up and down like this. So the more you learn about the show, the train wasn't the only thing that wasn't quite punched in the center. Um, 1869, he had his son selling philosophies out of the streets of Paris. But before that, he was basically a hired hand. The Olivier's, Rene and Amé, again, both young, 22 and 25. I mean, this was all developed by young people. We wish we had that kind of young people back in, the, in this uh, hobby today. Um, in 1865, they had been developing a, a velocity, and they rode from Paris to Albion, the first road trip with the velocity. Um, they got down to Lyon, they had some problems with velocities they had, and they changed them over a bit, different design, continued to ride the rest of the way to Avion. These were the money people, these were the ones that backed Michaud, these were the ones that did some of the development, and ultimately, ultimately because of Michaud's inability to, to follow through and be more business-like, they took over the business under their own wings and uh, continued with it. But these are the, these are the two here who really have the credit for putting the philosophy in the public eye and having the money back. Um, by 1874, they closed their company, Brigand, which they the uh, show. They got the show name, they took it back, and they turned it into company, Brigand, and distanced themselves from the show. And they finally, after uh, several years of just lugging along, closed the company in 1874. Pierre Lallemand, in 1863, um, had developed a, a primitive velocity of some sort. Of, um, he was working for Stroheimer in Paris as a manufacturer of toys, basically um, the horse for the cranks, the chain of the rear wheel. Um, they may have been making a tricycle at that time, shown in 1862, the year prior, over in London. He came up with the idea of doing two wheels with the cranks on the front wheel, and he practiced the, the art of balance and self-propulsion. So he was basically the, the credit with the first person to be able to do that, practicing up and down the long hallway. So he'd jump on pedal and be able to balance himself, really develop the idea of professional motion by pedal. Again, very young, 22. In 1965, or 1865, he jumps on a boat, comes over to America. The Olivier's take off on their ride south, he comes over to America. 1865, the Civil War just ended here. So he came over to make, make his fortune out of the new, the new country. Here we have uh, 1865, the Appomattox, uh, Lee surrenders, and Pierre Lallemand goes to Ansonia, Connecticut, a small little uh, town uh, just above New Haven. Um, they had machining there, and they had uh, clockwork, and a uh, foundry work. So he found work up there. He brought over from Paris the, the, the guts, uh, the front cranks for the Velocity, and then he recreated the Velocity here in the fall. Um, it's accredited that he, he was riding around in and around Ansonia. The, the drawings that you see here are from Pratt's book, um, and that was a, the, the most famous interview with uh, Lalamont regarding his uh, events in Ansonia. There's no press that we know of at this time to um, back the claims from 1865 other than his own word. We jump here to 1866, and April 4th, uh, Lalamont rides his bike through the green of New Haven, and the press covers it. So this is the first documented proof that Lalamont is actually riding philosophy here in America on the Green in New Haven. Uh, he, 20, uh, less than a month later, he files for a patent. So the first bicycle patent in the world was done by Pierre Lalamont in America in 1866. Um, it's granted uh, later in the year in uh, December. 
but this is a bit of the press. This is um, two days before the first press that's known in, uh, in France, where the Olivier's are spotted in uh, Lyon, perhaps, and all some philosophies. Um, here we have November, the, the patent is granted. You'll see the, uh, the design here, it's this classic serpent with a the backbone. It's kind of a, a loopy thing. <coughs> Um, it kind of looks like a, a, a hobby horse, a Johnson hobby horse. Uh, Johnson hobby horse. You see the cranks are on the front wheel. You have uh, weighted pedals already. Uh, you have a little ornamentation up the front um, for the, uh, the coasting uh, pegs are up there. And you have the saddle and the saddle spring, the classic serpent design. This is what um, ultimately the, the show was being, would be made in Paris by the, um, uh, by the show. Designed in conjunction with Lalaman, manufactured by the show, paid for by the Olympians. The following year was a big show in um, uh, France, in Paris. It was the International Exhibition, which took place. It was like a, a world's fair. And all through the summer, people from all over the world traveled to Paris. And the philosophy was ridden in and around the gardens there. During that time, Michaud had a very limited production of the uh, serpent bike. Um, here you have the gentleman riding the, the classic serpent type bike, open head, uh, the serpent backbone, and then over to the um, right here you have the classic diagonal frame. This one is a, a car which came into production around October or November of 67. The earlier wood one of this would have been to go, was actually the first one that was ever um, put in ads or uh, advertised. So you have the two, two designs basically coming out virtually at the same time. Um, the interesting thing is the one to the, the right here, the far, everyone refers to as the Michaud type, which actually it was predated by Farr, Cadeau, and a number of other manufacturers long before Michaud came out with it. They were kind of linked to the scene with the diagonal frame. Um, in Chicago, Wheeler brings back one from Paris. Um, they were for sale in Paris. But this is the first documented case where a woman actually brought back in the late autumn, later autumn of 67. 68, we're going through years pretty quickly because there wasn't a whole lot of activity going on. 68, uh, the Hamlin brothers were an avid, um, acrobatic group that traveled around the world. There were six brothers, they'd split into two groups, so they'd have three each. They'd get out of their acts, they did stage show, vaudeville, but they were known for their uh, high wire acts, trapeze acts, that type of thing. They were over in London and they were also in Paris in 67 at the, um, uh, the International Expo. We have no documented proof that they actually brought any philosophy back with them. But the following year, um, they had two incidences where gravity overtook them on one of the high wire acts. So um, they had uh, one, one of the brothers broke an arm, the other one had serious injuries which led to basically his uh, committing suicide. So the brothers went from six down to five in April of that year. Um, they were looking for different rides. I mean, they're constantly for different events, different acts for their, their, their uh, stage show presentations. Um, so they had seen the philosophies complete in Paris, but um, there's no documented proof that anything happened um, until later in 68 that they actually implemented the philosophy in the um, show. In July of 68, they took out a patent. Um, here you have the patent uh, on the left. You'll see the Hamlin patent. It looks virtually identical to the, the patent on the right on the top, which is the La Lamont patent. Uh, same circuit design, same pedals, same number of spokes, virtually the same bike. Um, the interesting thing on this bike is you can see a little curly cue on the back and on the front, which is basically just kind of a design additive thing. Um, the patent you see below the serpent is more what would become the American philosophy, kind of the rink bike, um, where it's a, a smaller uh, design. Uh, you don't have the, the large serpent frame on the top, more of a direct uh, close coupling of the wheels, where you just have a direct line to the back bone and straight to the rear wheel. Um, we'll find out later that if you go over to the, the one on the right here, the, the lower image, that's the Pickering bike. The Pickering bike almost is identical to that of uh, the Hamlin pad. Um, Again, this is happening in July. Uh, the, the, the Hamlins had contracted with Calvin Whitty in Brooklyn, uh, a carriage maker at a very, very large um, carriage shop. And you can see here the factory over on Broadway in Brooklyn. Not only do you have carriages, but also stables, because you always need a horse in front of 
find your carriage. So the carriage makers not only were head of vestiges in selling you a carriage, but they also were head of vestiges in housing or stabling your horse so they could make money both ways. Um, we don't know specifically why the Hamlins approached Calvin Whitty, but Calvin Whitty was approached and he started manufacturing these bikes for the Hamlins. Um, the first bikes are the serpents that were turned out by Whitty. Here are two examples of the uh, serpents. Um, the one on the left is the uh, Glenn Ames collection up in Vermont. The one on the right, highly from Glenn, is my, in my collection. These bikes have a few shortcomings on them. Um, as you can see, they're the basic serpent design. And they have this funny curly cue on the front, which is very familiar philosophies. But then you have this lovely curly cue on the back, which would be great for impaling yourself. So it's a design that you cannot, cannot be practical at all. <coughs> um, you also have non-adjustable uh, cranks. So one size does not fit all. There's no adjustable at all. And the capper is the fact that the saddle does not slide. Instead of having two bolts across the saddle frame where you can go back and forth, they're drilled right into the saddle frame. So there's no adjustability. Um, the Hamlins must have shown up, jumped on this thing, and realized its limitation. It has no adjustability. And there's great height difference in the Hamlins themselves, and for any marketability, these things would be absolutely ridiculous. So why would these two little shortcomings come uh, be produced here? Probably because they were working from a drawing, not from uh, an actual if they're working from the original uh, patent from the Lalaman, none of these things would be evident because they had not ridden the velocity. So it wouldn't be until they actually rode the velocity that they would have the, the know-how and the acknowledgement that the, the adjustment of the uh, crank and the adjustment of the saddle would be mandatory. In fact, when the Hamlins took out their patent, they patented the adjustable saddle, uh, the adjustable saddle and the adjustable uh, pedals, which had already been implemented over in Paris. Here we have, um, in July 22nd, in the Scientific American, the, the first large press of the Hamlins riding um, their type of bike. Here you have um, George Hamlin uh, riding uh, an early Hamlin type bike, again, an open head. It's, um, in August, uh, first week of August, they went to Boston, took the bikes with them, and they implemented it into their stage show. So every night when they did their presentation, they had philosophies up on the stage. They had to design a bike unlike the classic um, diagonal Michaud or the Serpent, which would be a higher position, is they drop the bike down. So that you're, you're, you're physically going just in small circles on the stage. You're not just going cross country. These are designed as either rink bikes or basically stage bikes. So every night they would have two shows. They were, you know, you'd get four or five hundred people new each night to see these things. And then during the day, they would take them out on the green in Boston and do stage races, trying to drum up more publicity for their show that would be happening in the evening. Uh, also on there in Boston, they showed uh, the local carriage maker up there, Surgeon, to, um, and they started making uh, velocipedes up there. Here we have kind of an interesting photo of Lauren Shields' collection. Over to the right, we have uh, two gentlemen here. First, we'll start with the classic one on the left is Pierre Lallemand, uh, riding one of his later uh, philosophies that he produced after he went back to Paris in 1869. On the right here, um, we have Frederick Hamlin, and we have a gentleman we believe is also Pierre Lallemand. We know when Pierre, uh, Pierre Lallemand came to America, we don't know when he returned. We know we only was back in 69, but we don't know what date he may have left in 68. So we don't know if there was some collusion between the Hamlins and Lallemand or ultimately with uh, Witte regarding the, the, the acquisition of the patent or the visibility of the patent or a possible business deal between them. There's a zillion type of Hamlin bikes out there. Um, your basic steel frame, very, very primitive, very, very crude. Um, there's been a zillion on the, uh, that uh, Mikey's auctioned off here. Uh, you know, every, every year or two, there's a, there's a Hamlin that goes through here. None of them are marked. We've not found one bike that has marked any Hamlin markings on the road. So they're all Hamlin acid. Um, a sergeant up in Boston made a, bike, a Hamlin type bike, but then they also later made a diagonal bike. So it was kind of blind curve. These type of bikes were kind of relegated ultimately to rink use because you can sit on them and put your feet easily on the ground and support yourself. Not very comfortable bikes. Um, 
in September, very shortly after the Hamlins first did their public presentation, you had Pickering uh, in, in Washington, in um, New York City, who came up with a philosophy that is virtually identical to the Hamlin path. So there has to be some sort of, we suspect, collusion uh, regarding there may have been some, um, the marriage between Witte and Hamlin's may have ended badly because as soon as the, the Hamlin started getting some press, the people, the, the half owner in the Lalamont patent up in New Haven contacted Witte about infringement. So there may have been some early uh, fallout and Pickering basically uh, took over the design of the Hamlin uh, type bike, the ring type bike, and came up with his bike. So it was a very fast uh, turnover that other people were making philosophies here in America. November 11th, um, you have people of society start taking note in uh, New York at the Alphaletta Club where they were doing inside racing of philosophies. Here you have a beautiful belt buckle, um, currently in the Lauren Shields collection, and bottom illustration of them racing around in the New York Athletic Club at the Empire Rink. The Empire Rink was kind of a, a societal thing, um, and here all of a sudden the philosophies are being shown with people the means to buy. So it was just like the lighting of the fuse, and it spread like wildfire. Everybody needed to have a philosophy. Winter is set in. We just saw them being raced in a rink. It was a natural to think that these were rink machines. They saw them on the stage with the Hamlins. As the Hamlins went from town to town to town to town, they're constantly applying the philosophy. So they're like the uh, patient A or uh, with the, the A virus. They would go from town to town to show everybody the philosophy on the stage. And the local carriage makers would see these things, and local people would want them. And they'd be planting the seeds for the, the carriage makers to go out and start making these. Um, with the rink use, uh, 10 years, uh, uh, 50, 49 years earlier, in um, 1819, uh, in New York, there was a, 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 a rink for the hobby horses. So when uh, a version of the Johnson hobby horse came over here, it was in a rink on the south side, the far south end of Manhattan. So people were accustomed to basically sitting in a room that was 30 or 50 by 50 and going in circles. So the, the rink idea caught on here, and it was winter. You weren't going to ride these outside. Um, in November, uh, the, the New York coachmaker uh, uh, took a, a, an article showing the early um, circuits uh, made by Michaud. Because the carriage makers were now threatened. Now the new horse was out of town, and no longer it might be replacing carriages. So these were the people that were making their uh, they're living, making carriages, and here's this new thing that might surpass, surpass the, the carriage by coming up with philosophy. So they were the natural people to immediately jump on the bandwagon, and it was covered very early. They're showing the circuit, which at that time was no longer a production of Paris, it was already an old design by about six months. In December, because of the success of the rink riding in November, the Purcell brothers, um, who had been photographers, kind of gave up their studio and opened it up for rink riding. And again, the, on Broadway in, in Manhattan, it was very successful. The societal people came there. They had a number of philosophies, and you would rent the philosophies and ride them around. They would sell them also, and you would have you could join a membership. And they were fairly successful. And this, this was kind of like the, the embryo. It just kept growing and growing and growing. Because of the success of that, all the empty halls up and down Broadway became velocity rinks within the next two or three months. And then over in Brooklyn, the same deal. Um, very successful, but most of the people that were going there were rink mentality, uh, and they would rent it. Like when you go roller skating, same mentality here. Um, so in, in, in New York City, you had the Woods Brothers who made carriages. They immediately jumped on and started having uh, velocities made in their uh, pack in New Haven. Uh, the Monon and Mercer Company, again a carriage company, um, started making um, very good machines. Again, most of these were copies of French machines. They would import a couple of the Michaud's or a, another similar diagonal machine and then start replicating uh, their own. Kerry, is this 68 or 69? This is all 68. This is all, this is December, November and December of 68. The production started ramping up on, at a rampant basis. Um, Brownell up in New Bedford, Massachusetts, again another carriage maker, started uh, coming out with um, uh, velocities. The carriage makers had, again, a very vested interest in control of what was the transportation. 
and you know they were quite concerned that the Velocipede would be replacing their mainstay. So they jumped on the, the Velocipede with both feet. Sergeant up in, uh, in Boston, uh, they got an early in the act in uh, August when they saw the, the Velocipedes and the Hamlins were up there. They turned out a very early uh, Hamlin type by Keir, um, and then ultimately came up with a diagonal later, a little more refined by later in the year. 69 is kind of your, uh, it, the Velocity had made such a big press splash that Winslow Homer decided to do this as the new year, uh, the new year riding in a Velocity, and the old year being dragged away in uh, a, a wheelbarrow. This is an interesting kind of design here. If you look at that wheelbarrow, and you see where that rear wheel is, and you see the straight line there, if you use that rear wheel, or the front wheel of the, of the wheelbarrow, think of that as the rear wheel on a velocity, and the weight being above that. That's basically designed for a diagonal uh, velocity. And where the man is standing, that'd be your front wheel. 66 was the introduction of roller skates in America. And so rinks were set up all over in your major cities, and uh, again, it was a society thing. People that had money, had leisure, um, and had time to go out, they would go to these rinks, rent the roller skates, and go circling around for a couple hours. It was, uh, you know, meet, 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 meet and greet people. Um, but it started to wane by the time of uh, winter of 68, 69. So a number of these velocity, or roller skating rinks quickly were adapted to velocity rinks. But America was already, the, the, the rink people, the rink, rink mentality was already ingrained in the people. So this is the next thing to put in that room. So, and you had a lot of, famous rink uh, skaters that then immediately jumped on the velocities to show their, their, their prowess in that. Um, you're, you're basically going in circles. A lot of these are second floor, wood floor buildings. So once you'd love to be a tenant on the below that, you're going around and around and around. And around. The rinks would open at like 10 in the morning and be open to 10 at night. Now, this is before we had these things called electric lights. So you have gas lights or kerosene lights at night. I mean, this is just one of them. And as you can see, they're cold. I mean, they're, they're renting any sort of second floor <laughs> or any sort of, they're converting churches, yeah. um, any sort of bizarre open spaces. The stables are, clean, you know, sweeping. We hope they swept the stables a little bit, open it up a little bit, and they're doing laps there. But you're doing, you know, a 30 by 30 room, a 40 by 40 room, and you're just doing circles around, and you're getting people that had never balanced before. <laughs> And they're doing circles on these crazy things, and of course running into things, or a building like this where you have columns. So you just put a few mattresses around the columns and hope for the best. Um, and of course, they haven't discovered here, you're all supposed to go in the same direction. Um, they made various trainer velocipedes that don't have the pedals on the front. Even though there, there's a couple of them out there, you, you assume the pedals are missing or the cranks are missing. They did make trainer ones, where you basically just straddle it like a hobby horse to try to learn the art of balance again. America is trying to balance for the first time. So you, now that you're trying to balance to propel yourself, um, the novelty of teaching your three-year-old or five-year-old on a bike and running behind is a lot of fun. Now, if you imagine doing that behind a 300-pound corpulent banker, it's not quite <laughs> so much fun. But again, that was kind of what you were doing in ring flight. Um, and you bought these tickets to ride for an hour, or you would rent it. Again, most people did not spend the $125, $130, $150 for a velocity. They primarily just rented it for a dollar an hour. And to keep the, the, the track, they would have to hand you a ball, or they would take a ball, and your velocity was number four, and they'd put it in a big clock here with a big, all these little holes around it, and your number would go on the, on the minute there. So when that hand got back there, they know when to call it in your velocity. So they're making a dollar an hour on these velocities that they bought you know, at 120 bucks a piece, 130 bucks a piece, so they, that's what they have to rent. Again, you're open from 10 in the morning to 10 at night, and you got people lined up where you're selling membership. You had tickets to ride, they had special events, they had special races, they had all sorts of promotion. Here we have a beautiful picture from uh, Lauren's collection, again, was very kind of sharing his images, in, outside of a, a roller rink in um, San Francisco. Um, as we all know, bicycling always started out with the male orientation. Um, the Purcell brothers.
brothers had, had sisters, as did the Pickerings. The Pickering brothers also had sisters. So the sisters must have been fairly persistent about, hey, how about us? So they came out with this wonderful, this is the, um, uh, the Purcell uh, woman's philosophy here, basically put a seat on top of a pogo stick. So I mean, it must have been a wonderful ride. They you know, it must have wobbled back and back very badly. But in theory, I was dressed with this. Here we have uh, Carrie Moore. And uh, Carrie Moore was a, a skating queen. So again, uh, as skating started to ebb, um, and Velocity started taking off, she immediately ditched the skates and jumped on the Velocity. Here she's shown with a, a Pickering bike here uh, and her early um, uh, roller skating. Again, the, the Velocity craze was a craze and died, and she ended up working for Barney and Bailey in a dog show later in the way. Velocipedes were like the pet rock. Even though we have a term viral today where you, you uplink it to YouTube and it goes everywhere immediately, this is what happened with Velocipede. Um, whether it be by cable or press, the, the stories were carried. If they happened in New York, they were picked up in Chattanooga, which was picked up in Des Moines, Iowa, which happened in Omaha, Nebraska. It was it just spread across the nation. And along with uh, the press, they started putting uh, songs, advertising, everything was velocity. It was just like this giant wave that encompassed many, many aspects of the world. Um, there, there's somewhere around 12 or 15 velocity songs. There's more songs written about velocity than 57 Chevy. It just, it's an incredible number that all of a sudden, all these people started writing songs because of this phrase. Um, the sergeant uh, commissioned a, a, a piece, a music piece for his uh, advertising, uh, as did Mercer Moen, um, uh, to have a, a song written for them. Uh, Go Lucky Velocity, his tune changed very rapidly. He sent everyone this love letter just claiming that he has the, the original patent and that anyone that rides, owns, manufactures, or even thinking about buying has to give him $10. Mm -hmm. um, and in the patent, uh, it goes into um, you know, the, the description of covering any sort of front-wheel drive, two-wheel vehicle. Um, and you have to be stamped. So you may have bought the Velocipede in November of 68, but by the end of February, you owe Liddy 10 bucks. And if you didn't get a stamp, so that you already own the bike, free and clear, you now have to pay another $10 and have it stamped. So on the side, you have these stamps. It's first kind of license plate. Um, how did they do this to people? You know, the Velocipedes are already sold. The most of the Velocipedes were in rinks. So Liddy sent out his henchmen out to the rinks and you just walk in and go, this piece of paper here says, Either I can shut you down or you give me 10 bucks per velocity and we'll go stamp them. You know, if you're getting paid a dollar an hour to operate these things, you shell out the 10 bucks for each one. They go around and stamp these things and you continue on your merry way. The, um, the manufacturers took out a license with Witty and again, 10 bucks a head. Would, you could stamp your, your, here you have a Wood Brothers, their standard nameplate, but with the, the patent number and the serial number of the, of the, uh, the license. Not necessarily the serial number of velocity but the number of their license. Now when it says November 20th, 1866, you do not have an 186 velocity. Forget about all that. These are all from 69. But again, you had to be properly stamped. Um, Wood Brothers here in their catalog shows a fine example. And instead of absorbing the cost and taking a little less of a profit as the manufacturers, they just added the 10 bucks on it. And they even explained here, Due to the claim of the patent, you're going to be paying the extra 10 bucks. Sorry, but that's the deal. Um, by March, Smith had come up with a counterclaim that his rocking horse was actually predating the Lala Mon. When you see the rocking horse, Smith's patent has nothing to do with velocity, but it was enough to stir the muddy of waters for a while. Ultimately, um, Witty and Smith made a deal together and pooled the patents, but for a while there, it was head to head. Um, April Goddard up in Boston, a, a writer, publishes a book. So this is an example of the first philosophy book in America. Um, ultimately, the only philosophy book in America because the, this is just about when things are going south. 
Um, when they imagine these philosophies were going to go out on the streets, um, the, America had spent all its money in railroads. 1863, we started the Transcontinental Railroad, and our government was more than generous trying to get our vast country connected by the rail. Um, you really can't make any money by putting roads in. But by rail, you know, the, all our politicians have vested interest in imagine that back then, um, in the railroads. So all the money was being stocked up in to the railroads to do the transcontinental railroad. The few sewage roads in the country were in uh, congested areas in the big cities, and they, they certainly didn't want to have philosophies taken over. So the politicians were quick to ban any sort of smoothie. You couldn't ride them on the sidewalks. Any of the, the Nicholson Block streets, they, they kind of prohibited. Ultimately, Brooklyn outlawed uh, lost streets being ridden during the daylight. Um, the end of April here, everyone again anticipated taking the bikes out. They were going to be racing. In the rinks, they had been doing racing inside. But, oh, we're going to go outside. Everyone, the horse races were very successful. So they brought the Union uh, racetrack in, in Brooklyn. And the end of April, and here they're doing miles, miles in six minutes. Five fifty-seven is the fastest. I mean, it's terrible. We need a mud-drenched track. The philosophies are sinking in sand and mud. It was a disaster. It was an embarrassment. So um, they ultimately they were going to have more races, but they just withdrew because of the conditions. And the roads really were not that much better. So um, the the whole wonderful fad of philosophy started falling apart when the reality of uh, outdoor riding fell, uh, was not there, the roads were just The end of April, the Hamlin's had a steam powered philosophy. Um, here we have the um, uh, Roper um, uh, steam, steam philosophy, he had a steam buggy, he had a steam philosophy. Um, again, just turned into a Barnum and Bailey type uh, event um, used in their, 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 their traveling shows. Not practical at all on the roads that we had here in America. May 4th, uh, interest changed from velocipedes to baseball, and the first professional game was played here um, uh, in, in Ohio. And May 10th, the Transcontinental Railroad was completed in 1863. So again, the, the wind was taken entirely out of the sale of velocity. They were not really useful on the roads at the time. Uh, rink life, the novelty of going around in circles was gone. It was nice outside. Interest turned to baseball, other things. And uh, the railroad was this thing, now you travel, it was far more important than the, the philosophy, the philosophy of yesterday's news. Um, as early as February, they cited that the philosophy had a limited life because it was a little bit like work after the ride or something. So I guess um, lethargy was just as popular back then as this is today. Um, but here you have a picture of a, 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 a later philosophy, a prince uh, designed on uh, the Pickering style with wire spokes and uh, metal fellows that took rubber tires. So again, the, the advancement happened very rapidly, but the fact that there really was no way to ride it outside killed the, uh, the whole uh, way. It was claimed that even though there were a huge number of riders that would go to the rinks during the peak, you're going to rent this for an hour, you're going to go around a circle, you're going to stop, you're going to rush, you're going to talk with people. The number of people that could actually ride them any distance very, very small. I mean, the, the geometry to ride a philosophy is trying at best. So, again, it was posting just a novelty, an indoor novelty, and they were fairly rare out on the streets. Um, here we have a sighting in the Scientific American just um, showing a ridiculous philosophy race, just uh, going in circles here as a music park ride, um, and always a, a fall off of the, the rinks. The rinks are being sold off, they're going bankrupt, they're having auctions in the, the local press of the New York Times, selling off the contents, the, the price of the philosophies are tumbling, uh, sales have fallen through the roof, uh, through the floor. Um, at, the, it's, at the end of September here, uh, there was a crash. Uh, Fisk and Gould uh, were cornering the gold market, so gold got up to about $140 an ounce. And when Grant dumped on the American um, backlog of gold, our supply of gold, because just and gold was trying to corner the market and trying to capture all this. When Grant dumped it on, it took a third out of the market inside of two hours. So the market went from here to down here inside of two hours. 
Now, just an interesting little thing for all you gold bugs out there. When it went from 140 down to like 120, 22 bucks, it only took 100 years for gold to go over the $140 mark in France. So invest carefully. <laughs> so uh, again, with the crash of the market here, just like we had that dynamic time, you can all remember 2008, fortunately it didn't affect the light market, did it? Not at all. <laughs> but it affected other people. So here when the crash happened, all the people that had the expendable cash to buy these things or go to the rinks, it, it left. It was gone. So you, 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 you immediately removed all the people that had the, uh, uh, the extra change to play with. Um, here we have Carl Kron. He was caught up in the whole, the whole mess of the, um, the philosophy rink uh, thing. But he waited until the end of uh, September, and the bikes that originally started at 135 bucks, he bought them 20 bucks. Okay, the price had just fell to the floor. Um, By the so, way, I will also buy them. That <laughs> <laughs> but Carl Kron put 10 miles on the bike, and he just gave up on it. I mean, this is going to be 10,000 miles later. So, I mean, if Carl Kron can't find enjoyment in riding on the streets at that time, you know they had to have some very serious shortcomings. 1870, the end of the five year period, in the middle of May, here we have the National Pedestrian um, Congress. These are people that walk. That's exciting. People go to watch people walk in rinks, okay? Lots of people come to watch people walk, walk in rinks. <laughs> They were going to have two velocity races. They only had enough contestants to operate one. It was just, the velocipedes were done. There was a small little faction that continued in Brooklyn. Um, Witty, who had the vested interest because they had the patent, operated a, a rental house, as did Mercer. They kind of traded back and forth, trying to drum up some interest in Prospect Park. They couldn't get Central Park, but they were in Prospect Park, and they had these rental houses to try to rent philosophies to ride on the, the lovely green trails, but ultimately ended up dying. Um, you had a lot of the manufacturers, the carriage manufacturers, that had leftover stock that just couldn't get rid of them. Mercer ended up marking down his bikes in uh, 70 and 71, down like five or ten dollars a piece to get rid of them. So they, they were kind of relegated to kids' toys, leftover whatever, un unmarketable. Um, and here in America, it pretty much died until um, 1876, there were a few onesie twosies here and there, but the, even though it continued in England, 69 they continued, even though the philosophy era died, the bicycling era continued. In, in France, even though the philosophy era again died, slowed down considerably by the end of 69, 70 they, they decided to take on Germany, that didn't go real well for them. But the, uh, there was enough of group mentality, club mentality started in both of those countries that the bicycling bug had bitten and they developed the high wheel bike. By the end of 1870, the philosophy style was gone and you already had advancements for the high bike. But here in America, it was snuffed out um, really until the introduction of 1876 with a very, very few exceptions. A few bikes imported and a very few bikes um, manufactured the side of the bike. So with that, thank you. And I'll turn it over to uh, David Hurley, who's going to continue with uh, another philosophy story from 1870. Thank <laughs> you.